Welcome to part three of our series of talks on misdiagnosis in body CT. And here we're going to look at very specific examples of things that are commonly missed, but you can avoid missing them if you're careful. Now we speak about bladder cancer. There's 72,000 plus new cases in the U.S. every year. Most are TCCs, others are squamous or adenocarcinoma. But we're not talking about those cases where the patient presents with hematuria and you're looking at the bladder as one of the sources of hematuria. We're not talking about a patient with known bladder cancer where you're doing staging. What I'm asking you is how often is bladder cancer an incidental finding? And if it is an incidental finding, how often is it missed on a routine CT scan? And one could ask, what's the legal liability of missing the diagnosis of bladder cancer in an asymptomatic patient? And what do you look for on a CT for the routine evaluation of the bladder on a contrast enhanced C of the CT of the abdomen and pelvis? Originally, the reason I thought of this problem was this case. This was a lawsuit, and um, I was asked by the MedKai to look at this, and was there an error present? This was a patient who was an older patient, presented middle of the night, acute abdomen, and the radiologist read on this non-contrast study, you can see the patient has an endovascular stent in place. They read thickening of the patient's colon. They worried about ischemic colitis. The patient had surgery and had ischemic colitis. Saved the patient's life. What the radiologist didn't mention was on scans through the pelvis, there looks like there's a mass in the bladder by the right UV junction. Fast forward three years, the mass is much larger. The patient presented with bone metastasis and now is being sued for missed bladder cancer. We don't typically think about bladder cancer as something we pick up incidentally, but the reality is bladder cancer is common. In older populations, we do a lot more scanning and we should be picking up incidental bladder cancers. So here's some things to think about. And we looked at our own work and we had missed a number of cancers. And the reason typically is we do good protocol. When we're scanning the abdomen and pelvis, we give a couple cups of water and we give IV contrast. When you're doing a case where you're doing aortic aneurysm, for example, or now TAVR procedures, when you scan through the pelvis, it's arterial phase. If the bladder is well distended, then any little bit of tumor that's present will enhance. Any little area of enhancement is suspicious for tumor. Do not assume a zone of subtle bladder enhancement is of no clinical significance. Most of the time, you can be very specific on the axials, but sagittals and coronals can help you out in other cases. An example, this was a patient we were doing for aortic aneurysm. There's a little enhancement at 12 o'clock. That's a five millimeter bladder cancer. You can see the bladder's well distended, which is why I can see it so well. It's interesting if you had bad protocol and the bladder wasn't distended and it was collapsed, you may not see the lesion. But once you do it correctly, you're going to pick up these incidental bladder cancers. What you need to do and what all of us do, and I have not seen a miss knock wood in a long time, is for 30 seconds, just look at the bladder. Make sure there's no focal areas of enhancement. If there is any enhancement present, like in this case, just say there's enhancement in the bladder. I wonder about a bladder cancer advised cystoscopy. You can see it nicely there again, incidental bladder cancer in a patient being evaluated for the aorta. And again, it's mildly enhancing, but bladder cancers will enhance to 70 or 80 Hounsfield units, maybe 90 sometimes. But the issue is urine is zero, so it stands out very nicely. It's not that it's so vascular. If it's that vascular, I would have thought of Theo maybe. But you got to be thinking about it. You can see it again in the coronal views here very nicely. And then on delayed phase, you can see when there's contrast in the bladder, there's the lesion. Maybe it's easier to see on delayed, but often you're only going to have the early phase imaging because you're doing an aorta and you're scanning arterial phase. Here's another example, incidental finding at about three o'clock in the left bladder wall with mild enhancement, a bladder cancer. There's no adenopathy present. So these incidental bladder cancers you pick up are low grade disease. The patients could get the lesions resected and they will be cured. If you present three or four years later, 
you got a problem. We have gone back, and there's an article coming out where patients had bladder cancer diagnosed today because of hematuria, then retrospectively look back if they had scans in the past four or five years. And not surprisingly, a number of patients had scans for other reasons. And of course, they were all outside scans, and the bladder cancer was missed. Another patient here, look at the uh, interior bladder wall in a patient for aortic aneurysm evaluation. There were three little dots anteriorly in the bladder. Those were three incidental bladder cancers, very nicely shown. Here they are on the coronal view and on the sagittal view. One, two, three. One more right here. I even wonder here if I'm looking at a fourth one, potentially. The presence of a discrete bladder mass or nodule should be considered suspicious for malignancy. In many cases, such lesions may be better appreciated in early phase imaging when they're surrounded by low attenuation urine. Our job is when you see it to call it and get cystoscopy. Okay, another error. Failure to review a select portion of the exam, such as the lung bases. We mentioned this before. We mentioned about the full field of view reconstructions, but this really refers to pulmonary embolism. We've made the point that um, when someone says rule out PE, there's a good chance you're going to do it correctly. If you're just doing a chest CT for a rule out METS, you may miss a PE unless you're looking carefully. But this is even different. This is when you were scanning the abdomen and you only had a little part of the chest. Now, the way we found this error was we do a lot of 3D imaging. So where you're looking at the pancreas with three millimeter thick sections, and so the lungs with three millimeter. When I did the 3D reconstructions, we looked at 0.75 by 0.5. And so we picked up many incidental pulmonary emboli. The point is you have to have a high index of suspicion. If you're looking at an oncology patient or any patient, but surely an oncology patient, up to a 5% chance of an incidental pulmonary embolism. So when you're scanning the patient, even the abdomen, but you got some lungs, look very carefully at it. And you're gonna see PEs like this. Make sure you widen the window and look carefully for those pulmonary emboli. Again, nicely shown in the coronal views here. Or in this example, again, what's interesting also is most of the PEs I see are in the right lower lung. I kind of say tongue in cheek that if you're very busy, since 90% seem to be in the right lower lung, if you only could look at one lung, look at the right and don't worry about the left. Obviously, you need to look at both lower lung fields, though it's surprising how much more frequent it is in the right lower lung, as you can see in this example. Now, I think one of the things has been written a lot about, and I'm not going to discuss it in great detail in this talk, is about AI. Now, AI for PE is used in multiple institutions, many different manufacturers, so I won't go into specific names, but the published literature shows excellent results. And as I speak to people, clinician acceptance is very high, both in academics and private practice. If you ask what the results are, well, the results are indeed very good, and I'll show you some examples in a moment. What many people say is, even people who are really good chest radiologists who are really comfortable reading PEs, they say, look, what it does for me is it makes me more confident. Also, I'm looking at a case where it's probably negative. I spend a little more time keep looking. If the uh, AI is negative also, I just won't waste the time. So again, confidence and increased accuracy is the answer. Just to make a point, this article by uh, Charlie White did show that more PEs were missed on abdominal CT scans than one might expect. And again, the challenge in identifying P is greater on abdominal CTs than on chest CTs because it's not the primary target. One of the things that these new algorithms with AI can do is look at any and all lung you have. So if you only have a little bit of lung because there's an abdominal study, they'll still look at it carefully. If you're doing a uh, a imaging study for lung mats with contrast, it'll look carefully at the PEs as well as when you're looking for a PE study. In this article by Checky from the European Radiology Journal, both the AI algorithm and emergency radiologist showed excellent performance in diagnosing PE on CT, high sensitivity and specificity and accuracy. 
The AI algorithm of repeated detection can help increase the sensitivity and negative predictive value of emergency radiologists in clinical practice, especially in cases of poor to moderate injection quality. What was really interesting in this article was that AI was especially good and much better than the radiologists when the study wasn't a perfect quality study, where the radiologist says, oh, probably negative, but can't rule out PE because the study is poor. There, the computer AI program is wonderful. And emergency radiologists recommend the use of AI for PE detection in satisfaction surveys to increase their comfort and confidence in their final diagnosis. That indeed is very important. In, this, uh, in that same article, in the entire cohort 2019, and they used AI Doct, it captured 19 PEs that were not diagnosed by radiologists in 19 distinct patients. In other words, the AI algorithm could correct and misdiagnose PE approximately every 63 cases. When you think about the large number of studies done, it can be very valuable. Indeed, mortality and recurrence rates for untreated or missed PEs range between 5 and 30%. We want zero missed PEs, and AI is going to bring us closer. In conclusion, the study confirms the high diagnostic performance of AI algorithms and the importance of using them. So I know more and more people are getting involved. AI Doc is one of the big companies with a lot of really good success stories, but I think it's reaching the point where private practice and academics are actually using them, no longer evaluating them. In this article by Toff, AI-assisted workflow prioritization of IPE on routine CT scans in oncology patients showed high diagnostic accuracy and significantly shortened the time to diagnosis in a setting with a backlog of exams. So oncology patients, we said before, 5% can have incidental PEs. Maybe you're not reading the study to later. Some places do it that way because they need to do the rhesus reads. But the patient was just there. You're reading it five hours later. That's a problem. The patient may be gone. You can run the AI algorithms that would pick up PEs before you get to read the study. Very, very good results. In total, 11,736 CT scans in 6447 oncology patients were included. Prevalence of PE was 1.3%. Okay, so the AI software detected 131 true positive, 12 false negative, 31 false positive, and 11,559 true negative results. Sensitivity and specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, particularly negative predictive value, was really, really impressive. Radiologist misrate of incidental pulmonary emboli was significantly reduced uh, from 48% without AI to 2% with AI. Again, AI needs to be used, and now seems to be the time. Again, the same article, AI-based prioritization tools have been studied for use cases such as intracranial hemorrhage, acute pathology on chest radiographs, and PE, and it does work. The results are successful in pulmonary embolism. So their conclusion was AI software for detecting incidental PE at chest CT in patients with cancer showed high diagnostic accuracy in a large sample size. Again, very, very important. Now, you might say, well, we look at all of our oncology patients within 20 minutes. Maybe it isn't as important in your practice. But one will have to admit that the results that are being published shows that AI makes you better. It's not very expensive. I really don't understand what the argument is. There really is no good argument. In conclusion, we demonstrated that commercially available AI software had high diagnostic accuracy in the detection of incidental PEs on chest CTs in patients with cancer. Very, very important. Now let's do one other area, gastric tumor detection. One of the challenges I mentioned before with protocols is the stomach is not distended, and so is there pathology present or is there not? Coronal views will be helpful, but coronals and sagittals in 3Ds will not going to help you if the stomach is not distended. We spoke before how 30% error rate without IV contrast. Articles by Megabo here. In the ER, you need oral contrast. Yes, it could theoretically delay you a little bit, 
But as he says, our physicians will always choose good medical care over time slashing, corner cutting methods that impress the dashboard monitors, perhaps at the expense of excellence in patient care. Alex goes on to say, it's the insistence on relentless attention to detail and assistance on highest standards of quality and performance that are keys to productivity, efficiency, most certainly not through cutting corners. Perry Pickard, another article, spoke about this mainly in oncology patients. A disturbing recent trend is to forego oral contrast material. And as radiologists, we need to make certain that we do the right thing. You need to give contrast. And I'll just show you an example. Here was a patient, had some vague symptoms, had a chest CT. This is some of the scans through the abdomen. Is this a tumor in the stomach? The fundus looks worrisome. The body looks worrisome. Am I dealing with gastric cancer? We brought the patient back, gave the patient water like we always do. Image on your right. The stomach is absolutely normal. Okay. Look at those two images. Image on the left, you always have to worry about tumor. If you would have given oral contrast, you would have said normal stomach, next case. There's nothing to even worry about. All you have to do is give a cup of water before the patient gets on the table. And you can see how nicely in the coronal and the 3D, the stomach is normal. Or the stomach's well distended, so you can see this gastric polyp very nicely shown. Or in this case, with abdominal pain, if the stomach wasn't distended, you couldn't say much. But here, the stomach looks good in the fundus. But look at the antrum. There's diffuse wall thickening. This was an unsuspected gastric adenocarcinoma. On the flip side, take this case. What are you going to say here? The stomach's not well distended. Is this wall thickened? Is it normal? I don't know. What can you say? You can't say anything with any real certainty. Well, that patient was scanned previously, and the reason they weren't distended is they were going for endoscopy, but that patient has hundreds of gastric polyps. They're benign, but look at all of these polyps you missed on the prior study, okay? The stomach needs to be distended. When we speak about error rates, I go back to protocols being important. This example, another case, patient was referred to us for a section of a pancreatic mass in the tail of the pancreas, you notice here, this is arterial phase. There's a little bit of textural change in the liver. It means there's cirrhosis. When you have cirrhosis, you got to be careful because varices can be missed because varices opacify on venous phase. You can overcall things as nodes or tumor. Again, look at that arterial phase. This is really worrisome. Is this a gastric mass? Is it a pancreatic mass? What's going on? But when you get the venous phase, these are all varices from the patient's portal hypertension, and cirrhosis. Not the most impressive cirrhosis you've ever seen, but those were impressive varices. And so the patient needed to be treated for their liver disease, but did not need a distal pancreatectomy. Look how extensive those varices are. Now, the same issues occur in the kidneys, but again, there's different issues. And let's do this. Let's stop here and come back and start with the kidneys in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.